Welcome ladies and gents to episode 3 of the Master of Industry playthrough. Hope you're having a great day. If you need to catch up, click the card for episode 2. Alright, I'll start today with a couple of boosts to the manpower pool and a quick boost to suit to production. We can place a farm crucible of ice, so I'll go ahead and do that. Admin tech isn't far away from level 4, one more level before we select the first idea group. The agenda of the common folk has been completed, 600 troops isn't groundbreaking but it's free manpower so can't complain. Profits are starting to ramp up, production's overtaken, taxation is intended, so everything's heading in the right direction. Right, so we've moved on a year and Admin Tech 4's come in. We've rushed it a little bit, so we are ahead of time. It does give a 20% increase in production efficiency, so we can collect some Admin points for a while, wait until the cost of level up lowers, and make some extra cash while we wait. Renshaw's without a farm, so we can put one there. The mission should be near to complete, if not completed already. The title says it all, doesn't it? Night King's made the transition from Frosty Maniac to decimal points, high frequencies, bang, bang, bang. It's all smoke and mirrors though. It's an alternative playstyle, but it can't continue like that. Horde will rise, we've just got to do the groundwork first. The final personality traits come in for the Night King, and he's ended up calm. It makes a lot of sense, due to the lack of military action. The stability cost modifier isn't important right now, but there's every chance it'll come into play later on. The mission's done, we've built all the farms and mines necessary, so we'll get the building spree perk until the end of the game. Building a war chest is unrealistic right now, so we'll build to the force limit first. Okay, let's have a look. We could go for the sale of titles, but it's not really rewarding enough. Let's see what the council's got to offer. As much as I'd like to get involved in the tea trade, I've got no idea where it is on the map. There's no point pursuing that. The only way I can get allies at this point is by conquering and force vassalizing. Not 100% sure if that counts. So the only viable option here is probably raising autonomy in Frostfort. But to be honest with you, all of the options are pretty naff. <laughs> Okay, so this is a bit odd. I gave Frostfort more local autonomy and I failed the agenda anyway. Isn't that what they asked for? I don't really mess about with autonomy in EU force, there's every chance I've misunderstood something. If you happen to know the answer, please leave a note in the comments. Alright, let's get back to the important stuff. Diplomatic tech's lagging behind. We've got the base development, but it does need to be more efficient. Halfway to level 5 admin tech. I think we will select a military-based idea group. It does make sense, we need to start making some moves. Time to make some small improvements, move the game on a couple of years, stack up some points, and then we'll get to admin tech level 5. Remember the date, ladies and gents, the horde begins to rise. We've decided on the quantity route, and we will try and snowball, and send masses of the dead to destroy the free folk. Let's have a quick look at the ideas. The first idea is huge for us if we're going to make this work. 10,000 extra troops to the manpower pool is vital, and it'll grow in step with the base manpower. All conserve means that the manpower pool recovers quicker, and those ideas together will make for a really powerful combination. Reductions in regiment costs and land maintenance aren't as important right now, but will make a massive difference later on. I don't expect to use mercenaries very much, so this is a low priority perk. Larger garrisons are always useful, if we need to play defensively, and a reduction in land attrition is welcome. There are lands that can't support large armies, so this perk will come into play later on. Overall it's a bit of a mixed bag, but the first two perks are the important ones. Renshaw could do with a bit more development, so we'll invest a little bit more there. Estate loyalty is looking dodgy as well, so we can issue a sale of titles for the first time. I didn't want to do this so early on, but the loyalty issue needs sorting out. I'm going to get rid of the farm in the Crucible of Ice and replace it with a fort, and the reason for that is to create a forward defensive line. When we've got more building slots, we can put the farm back. My thinking is, if we trap the armies into attacking the forts, we can dogpile onto them with superior numbers. They won't be able to get away once the movement locked. We can do the same thing in Renshaw, the only other way into our territories via the coast. Right, let's take a quick break from the internal affairs and look at the map. The Thens and Ice Guard appear to be the most apparent threats north of the wall. Grimmy looked like the most likely target to begin with. I want to take control of the coastline as I've already mentioned. A battle for the Icewind Vale is looking increasingly likely. We have a few early casualties south of the wall, House Reader no more, and the Karstarks have disappeared too. Castle Black didn't lose their land in the end, which I'm surprised at. They were losing the war but turned it round. The forts are up and running, which is great news, always good to have an insurance policy. We're mothballing for now, there's no point paying for maintenance until we need them operational. Increasing local manpower modifiers in each province is a good idea, so we'll start building barracks starting with Frostfort. Still ahead of time with admin tech, so it won't hurt to put a few points into boosting the tax take. Diplotech level 3 gives a welcome boost to trade efficiency, so we'll take that. First quantity idea is almost available, we'll build more barracks before we get it though. One more quick improvement in Nightstone opens up another building slot, so we'll get a barracks put down there. Might as well boost the tax take too while we're here, why not? Hello, I like money. This is what we've been waiting for ladies and gents, the first vital piece of the jigsaw. 
It's going to push the manpower pool up to about 35,000 or so. We'll have enough men to cover Grimmy, but we'll need to be able to account for the allies too. Council time again. Not really interested in appeasing the clergy at the moment. 30% trade power at the trade node seems achievable, so we'll go for that one. Granting some more privileges might help. Guaranteed religious autonomy seems like a good one. Nets a hefty increase in loyalty from the common folk. Hopefully it won't backfire later on. We still have a few ships to build before we hit the force limit, so we can sort that out as well. One small boost to admin before we move the game on a bit and bank some more monarch points. Grimmy are moving up the coast and establishing borders with us. If they're bringing the war to us, that's fine. If I needed persuasion to go down the military route, it's a done deal now. They currently sit at tech level 5, which is a bit ahead of us, but I'm sure we're ahead with development. We have a ton of spare cash available, so we can get a second artisan's guild down. The Grand Tournament event's quite timely, hopefully we can get a decent general out of it. Cash flow situation's looking great, not far from 10 ducats profit per month, we can start to put together an army with that. I think the main priority now is to save some military points and rush as many levels as possible. An extra military point per month would be useful, so we'll grab an advisor to help out with that. The infantry fire modifier will boost the weak battle line. I've been putting it off long enough now, it's time to start building the army and spending some cash on the military. We'll start with some undead skirmishers, nice and cheap and quick to recruit. They'll be the base of the horde. Force limit's quite low at the moment, we won't be able to spam out units until we build some extra buildings or take more territory. Okay, so the first set of recruits are ready, and we can upgrade to military tech level 3. I'll add a couple of artillery pieces and send all the troops to World's End. It does have the highest force limit, so it makes sense to keep them there for the time being. We won't suffer any attrition. In its current composition, the army needs a few more cavalry divisions, and a stronger infantry line. We can upgrade to level 5 diplomatic tech. I'm more concerned with the military tech level, but it does improve the colonial and trade ranges. Financial situation is still looking good. Profits have taken a slight hit, but still making a decent amount overall. Alright, I'm going to send the army down to the fort at Renshaw. Grimmy is starting to amass their forces down to the south, so we can meet them at the border if needs be. Taking a quick look at the potential threats, Grimmy are at military level 6. Surrounding clans are either level 5 or 6, so we need to keep up. A few moments later. Time's moved on quite a bit, 44 years into the game now, and military tech level 4 is available. We are catching up, slowly but surely. It'll be a while before we're in contention, but it steps in the right direction. We can follow that with Diplo level 6. Getting 12 points a month and saving the vast majority of them has really helped. Could be time to switch the national focus up to military now, now that we've caught up. Looking at the agenda for the merchants briefly, we've got 5 years to complete it. I think I've made a bit of a mistake here, it's not as clean cut as I originally thought. I'm guessing that I need to have Hardhome as a core province, and if that's the case I'm going to need to conquer it. It's currently in the possession of the Forest Walkers. If I declare war on Iceguard, I might be able to drag the Forest Walkers into war as an ally, conquer them that way. We top the stats in current trade power, and we're way ahead in province trade power too. It's roughly what we were aiming for to start with, so it's success in that respect. We make the most money at the trade node, very happy to reinvest that back into the army and the infrastructure. Definitely need some more territories though. The mountain clans and the free folk are expanding and we're currently static. Okay, second idea groups available, I think expansion is the way to go. Thinking of possibly grabbing the uncolonised territories to the north and moving towards Iceguard that way. It will be a while before we get the first colonists, but we can get an advisor to help out with some extra points. Time to bolster the ranks a bit with some more artillery and infantry. Money stockpiled in case we need to take on mercenaries. We should continue recruitment for the invasion of Grimmy. The balancing act continues with some more production boosts, keeping the money generation ticking over. We can have an extra cav unit and bring the total army size up to 14k. The new recruits are ready to go, so I'll bring the army together at the fort. We'll get some more troops into training shortly. So I'm taking some attrition here, that was a bonehead move. <laughs> I thought the force limit was higher in Renshaw, but obviously not. I'll move the troops to World's End, no point taking the damage. Military tech level 5 is available, pretty close to our neighbours now. We've got superior manpower reserves and an army which will be able to compete at least. Uh, tech level's been brought together a bit too, so there's not much of a spread anymore. We've got a lot of spare cash floating, so we can afford to bring some more advisors on board. We'll set the national focus to military, extra points are needed in that department. We can offset the losses by installing advisors in the other techs, there's no need to get hung up over the modifiers, we just need the extra point per month. When we gain larger profits per month we'll move to the expensive advisors, 5 ducats a month's a bit steep at this point. Let's make some more units to hit the force limit, a couple of skirmisher regiments and some cavalry do nicely. Excellent, we can complete the mission, I'll happily take a reduction in the land maintenance. Didn't realise we'd complete the second mission too, that's a nice bonus. Boosts up world's end a bit and brings construction and development costs down, very nice benefits to have. I have to admit, I expected Grimmy to rival us, but Iceguard works out just as well. If we have a quick look at the military comparison, we've got the edge on the land, but we lag behind in navy strength. With that in mind, we'll make some more ships for the trade fleet. After we make these ships, we will be capped out, so the next ships we build will probably be Karaks, the heaviest ships available. It's worth considering swapping some of the trade ships out. The clergy sit at 38% loyalty. We have to give them a token gesture to keep them sweet. 
Installing the Clerical Advisory Council means we don't lose any land. We can get the first colonist now, so I'm going to go for it right away. We need more land, it's simple as that. Taking Wolf's Grave means Iceguard can't expand any further west. No idea which resource we'll get from it, keeping my fingers crossed for a gold mine, but it's probably going to be furs. We will need a force over there to squash the natives when they throw a wobbler. I'll split off 2,000 troops and send them to the Fort of the Crucible of Ice. A 5k detachment's more than enough to deal with the natives. The new ships are ready and the fleet's joined together at World's End, at least they will do in a second or two, and we'll be sending them back off to the trade node. We have enough points to take the second quantity idea, all can serve, and we get the first White Walker idea as a bonus, plus one army tradition yearly is pretty good. Colonists want to move into Cutwind on their own? Yeah, I'll take that, no issues there. Using a two-star general to squish some natives might seem a bit overkill, but I don't want to run any risks. With two colonies running, I don't really want to raise the army maintenance just yet. You can see how expensive establishing multiple colonies is. Six ducats a month is a lot. Corruption's on the rise as well, so it's costing to keep that under control too. Plenty of diplomatic points to spend, so we'll boost up development in a couple of provinces. We've lost our military advisor, so we need a replacement. Second advisor comes with an increase in siege ability. That's a no-brainer, we'll need that soon enough. Hopefully he won't die before we declare war. That's going to wrap things up for today. I'm still messing about with the format of the series in terms of recording and editing. Feel free to leave constructive feedback in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to be notified of future episodes, and as always, thanks for watching.